We're on. Okay. This is Malcolm Berman with Sid Mandelbaum. Mandelbaum, 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 as Seinfeld would say. Okay. Sid, let's take it away. You introduce our guest. I will. Uh, first, uh, I've been away a couple of weeks on the left coast. And uh, during that time, Rock and Wrap It Up actually signed up uh, Target. And Target now is beginning to give uh, food uh, to the Rock and Wrap It Up program on Long Island uh, to join uh, partners like Costco, Trader Joe's, uh, Panera, Chipotle. And uh, we're really blessed to have them. Uh, and uh, right now, they've donated over 1,300 pounds of food from three different uh, donations. All of it has gone to the Gammy's Pantry in the uh, Five Town area, uh, where three to 400 families come every day to get food from Gammy's, which Rock and Wrap It Up generates. Uh, Jackie has been a friend for over 20 years. Uh, we go back a little bit longer because when we first met, uh, Jackie was doing a fabulous fundraiser for Jerry Cooney. Jerry Cooney, the boxer, uh, had a charity for uh, fighters that were having neurological problems after their careers ended. And uh, I think the organization was called FIST, Jackie. Does that sound right? It's so funny. I just moved my stuff. I had to move out of my city apartment and I brought my computer from there and I'm trying to transfer all the stuff. And I just came across the pictures from one of those major fist events at the Meadowlands. And I mean, you wouldn't believe it was every fighter you ever heard of. Plus the guy with the hat. The, the, who was the guy with the hat that reviewed all the fights? Uh, I, geez, I never oh, think of his name. Uh, not Bernie, but, uh, uh, but somebody. And... Uh, and Jake LaMotta and Larry Holmes. and I was Cooley. there with you with Jake LaMotta and Larry Holmes. It was, it, was, it was a great, great, great night. And I, that might have been the night we met. Yes, it was and, the uh, night we met. And then we were sitting together. I had been invited uh, by a guy by the name of Tom Foley, who was close friends with one of the organizers. And uh, Jack and I were sitting together and... Uh, it turned out that Jackie knew a lot of my family from Oyster Bay. Uh, the first Jewish family that moved into Oyster Bay were the Bernsteins in the late 1890s. They got it? And, and Jackie uh, was a good friend of Herman Bernstein that ran a haberdashery store and was known for his joke telling. Uh, I'll, I'll there, let you were, a little bit about actually, that. There were actually two Bernsteins in Oyster Bay. There was Bernstein's Hardware and Bernstein's Clothier, which is uh, in a little tiny town. It was like it was. It was like there was a Bernstein's everywhere you looked, you know. Yep. And uh, and there were some characters in that family. There were characters in everybody's family. <laughs> but uh, I, I tell you, Malcolm, it's very hard to concentrate with Sid undressed. Uh, I was counting on him to wear a shirt, but uh, I, I'm so busy trying to read his tattoos, I'm mesmerized. Well, this is, I feel like we're in a fighting mode, and I had to get and look the part. Yeah, okay, the, you the, know, Brook, the Brooklyn part. Brooklyn. You know, the way Round, I met Jerry Brownsville. Cooney, uh, we, started, we started yeah. comedy on Long Island at a little restaurant named Cinnamon, and it was owned by two guys, and one of them was Michael Cooney, who was Jerry Cooney, who is Jerry Cooney's brother. So Jerry came into the comedy shows all the time. And so me and Jerry have been friends since like 1979. We go way back, way, way, way back, you know, great fun. And, uh, and he's a good character and Sid's a great character. And the, more, and the more Sid and I got to know each other, the more, you know, the more we un unpeeled the onion or peeled the onion rather, uh, it, it just got more and more interesting, you know? Just to... Uh, uh... Uh, a little background. My dad was a, a bantamweight fighter back, but back really? in the back in the twenties. Wow! He, he started he started fighting. I think when he was 16, 17 years old. And he was born nineteen oh three, and in in those days, what, what I eventually found out was that uh, uh, professional boxing. If you didn't have, well, I don't, don't even know if you had a name or not, but you would fight in Brooklyn one night take the car, go to Philadelphia, have another fight the next night, take the car, go to Chicago, have a fight the next night. That's the way they earn money. 
Jesus. Like they put in five, six times a week. For the life of me, I'll never know how anybody can do that. I just cannot comprehend. You know, I, I don't go to fights. I went to a couple where, but we were way, way back. I think I was with Joe Franklin or Soupy Sales or something, but we were far from the ring. But the Howard Stern show, for whatever reason, Geraldo Rivera challenged Frank Stallone, Frank Stallone to a boxing oh, yeah. match. And we, we went to Gleason's gym and we sat ringside, like where the announcers sit. And it was just Geraldo and Frank. They're not professional boxers. And I, I was just mesmerized just when you actually hear and the thud and, and see the, the sweat come off the guy's face when he gets punched. I'm like, my God, I felt like I was at the Roman Coliseum in, in AD 50, you know what I mean? Like, Jesus. Yeah, you know. years ago, I used to produce a show called Ringside with Johnny Ortiz. And this was when, this was back, I think, in the 90s. And we, I took my wife uh, and we had like uh, ringside seats over Olympic Auditorium. And she used to like boxing on TV, but we got up close to them. And she saw when someone got hit in the head and you know their eye blow up and the blood come out and the scars, she couldn't take it anymore. No, that's a, that's a different can of worms. When you're right there, like, wow. Just like the difference in watching baseball and actually being at a baseball game, how much more exciting it is. It's exactly the reverse. It's like, it's, it's so much more appalling. You know, I, I, geez, you know, I, I was a fan of wrestling and I used to watch it on TV, but I couldn't even imagine being at one of those things, you know, my God, you know, the, the, the craziness, you know, when you're a kid, you're buying all the, everything that's going on. And I distinctly remember like third or fourth grade. At some point, I used to watch Sunnyside Gardens and Comac Arena and watch three or four hours of, of professional wrestling every, every Friday, every Saturday. And at some point, as a young kid, I maybe fifth grade, I watched the guy jump off the turnbuckle and come down on somebody's head with his knee. And I said, wait a minute. That would kill somebody. And I, turned, I never turned back again. I, all of a sudden, I realized, this is malarkey. Next thing you know, they're going to tell me there's no Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> have, have you ever watched professional uh, wrestling now? No, I, you know. I, they take chairs and tables and, and break it over people's heads. It's. I, and what about, what it. about that other thing where they're getting the, where they're getting in the little circle, the arena, and, and literally uh. beat the hell out of each other? Well, I, you know. Mankind is rapidly deteriorating. You know, I thought I was screwing people up with my bad jokes. You know, it's <laughs> relatively harmless, you know. Yeah, well, anyway, you guys have met at a, uh, uh, with Jerry Cooney, with Jerry Cooney over at the, some event. Well, this was a fundraiser, fundraiser for his organization to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was head at the, uh, one of the clubs in, uh, in the Meadowland Arena, I think called Pegasus. If I'm not mistaken. And, that sounds right. And uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars were raised. And there was quite a number of celebrities there, as Jackie said. Jake LaMotta was there. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Holmes was there. Uh, and La uh, Larry Holmes. Larry Holmes. Uh, Larry, Larry Holmes. Holmes. And we we just, he was George there. George Foreman. Be, all every, of them, all everybody was there to, to support uh, this charity, which really has. Uh, there's so many fighters that have these uh, these neurological conditions very similar to football fight uh, football players. Yeah. They get hit in the head, they have a uh, brain bleed, and there are huge problems. And uh, Jerry raised a lot of money for it. I, I don't know if it was enough uh, because uh, it's constant and. Uh, you hear all the time about people that have had these neurological conditions similar to PTSD uh, that, that need treatment. So I'm speaking with Jackie at this event and, and it turns out that Jackie graduated, he was a couple of years older than my cousins, uh, two twins, Ray Ellen and Sue Ellen Bernstein, who were the daughters of Herman Bernstein, who also was the head of the American Legion uh, in Oyster Bay, uh, and uh, his daughters uh, had graduated Oyster Bay High School, I think maybe with Jackie's sister, but she was a year younger. 
The hat side's about, no, she's much younger. My brother, they probably graduated with my brother Bobby, I think it was, who was two years younger. So, you know, it's just a very small world and we're sitting there, you know, bullshitting and uh, Jackie was interested in our charity and we spoke and I asked him if he would uh, become, you know, uh, try to be an MC for one of our golf events. And he said, well, I play golf, I'd love to do it. And that's how uh, he got involved with us. Uh, he uh, started about 17 years ago being the MC for our golf event and quite a number of other fundraisers that we ran. And uh, Jackie's great. Uh, Jackie also worked for a guy, you know, you've been in radio, Malcolm, about 30 years ago, uh, I was part of a consortium that bought a radio station in New Jersey. And our first DJ was a guy named uh, Mark uh, Chermack. Uh, Chernoff. Chernoff, mm -hmm. who happened to have uh, been Jackie's boss, I think, for a little while. Well, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't the boss. He, was, uh, he came in as the new program director. And uh, we, I, I, I don't know if you're ever a Boy Scout or a Cub Scout or with a group of guys and you pull stunts on each other. So he was the new general manager. And we told Mark Chernoff, that anybody new at the station has to show Howard Stern their penis. <laughs> and, and he, Howard went into the men's room and Chernoff actually showed it to him. Oh. And then of course he came back on the air and said, I can't believe this stupid moron believed. You know, and he, and he was, he's, I think he's still mad at me. I think if I saw him tomorrow, he'd still be mad at me. And you know, because I, because I'm sure it was my idea, but how, you know, it was just so funny. Oh, that's just the worst. Oh, it, it just, that's it just, the worst. So, oh, it's just, but it's the, it's the most harmless stunt. You know, oh, it's like God. the old Boy Scout thing, you know. You know, well, did he had, do this? He, he had this voice. He always talked a little bit like this. Mm -hmm. He had a little nasal and, we couldn't believe that he was our disc jockey on our radio show. Yeah, he's, he's a little nudge, but he was not, he's a nice guy. You know, nice but... guy. Oh, my God. And he, he got to start on our station. And uh, it was one of the reasons why we actually bought it. We actually lost money for seven years. And until we changed formats from soft rock mm -hmm. to country around 1987 or 88, we started making money. But after that, I thought my wife would kill me. All of us had to put in an additional 10 grand every year to make up, you know, six guys had to come up with 60 grand every year for seven, eight years until God bless Garth Brooks, all I could say. <laughs> Malcolm, you know, radio, is, it's a tough road to hoe. You know, a few people make all the money and everybody else makes no money. It's like the racetrack. It's actually like the movie show business. You know, everybody else is scraping to make a nickel and the top people just roll in it you know yeah, so. well, well, radio has changed so much because it used to be the individual stations with the individual owners now all of this has been grabbed by the conglomerates and, oh. origi and originally the dj like uh, rick d's or, or or back in the old murray the k i'm going way back in new york or, or cousin brucey they could pick the music that they wanted and, it was and very Hey, do you know a guy named Ron Farber? Does that ring a bell with you? No, no Barry Farber. No, Ron Farber, been, he's been in the radio and the, and the, and the music industry for 40 years. And he, I, I'm just, I just took a shot because you oh. might have said, oh, I worked with him for 30 years. You know? <laughs> but that stuff is all, it's, it's really, really interesting. Yeah. All the rock and roll and the Murray the K. That, that's the sweet spot of my era. Yeah. You know, no, no, to the Murray, Murray the K rock and roll shows, you know. Yeah, but now, now uh, on, on the rock stations, they don't pick their own music. They have they have uh, uh, groups that decide. You know, they, they, and it's they automatic have... and a tight playlist. And, uh, you know, it was even even it was getting crazier a long time ago. Even Rick Dees, the, the reason I got in with Rick Dees is because he would take uh, take my jokes and put them on his weekly top forty, where they actually sent you know, LPs around to all the different syndicated stations. Yeah. And it would be the Rick D's top 40 countdown hits, you know, and it was such a, and that's all you heard on the radio. You know, I don't know if you know, but Rick D's, I have a dirty joke line, 516-922-WINE. And that's how Rick D's found out about me. And he used to tell his listeners 
that that phone number was Tom Selleck's home phone number. And my, <laughs> my, my joke line went to the moon. He was the name that he, Rick D's actually named me Jackie the Joke Man Martin. He, you know, he's a good character. I, I remember, you know, I remember re uh, meeting Rick. Rick was like the number one DJ in, in Los Angeles. But yet when he came off as a, uh, I met him one time at a function for the station. And he came off as so humble. I mean, he came up to me, say, hi, I'd like to introduce myself. He was friendly, but no pretense at all. Very, 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 very nice guy. You know, I went out and did a sh couple shows for him. And uh, he, he, of course, beat me up financially. But uh, I guess you got to expect this in the rock and roll business. But he, he couldn't have been nicer. You know, I think he had plastic surgery before anybody knew it existed. You know, he looked 20 years old when he was 70. You know what I mean? But he's a, he's a nice guy, nice guy. Well, well, that was Dick Clark. Oh, oh, oh you know, you, you read his history. He was the, Dick Clark was the lowest of the low. And that, if there ever was Mr. America, Mr. Sunshine, Mr. Nice Guy. And he was a, just a class A1 prick, you know, like, I mean, uh, it's, I, 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 it's just I, I, so... Yeah, you, you, you never read about you've read about him. I'm yeah, sure. but I never met him. Who, who I met, who I always think, who looks like he's plastic surgery was Pat Boone. But Pat Boone is sweet. We did some shows with him and interviews with him. He is so nice and he's real. Yeah, I met him a couple of times and he really is a nice, nice guy. Uh, Dick Clark came on, actually came on the Stern Show a few times and and yeah, he was plastic surgeon way up, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I don't even remember the premise why he would have come on the Stern show, but he did, you know, it, probably on a bet, you know. Uh, well, at that time, I mean, Howard was like, like a, a legend. I mean, at least in Los Angeles nationally, yeah. Well, it was interesting. No, but he came on before, you know, in the old days, nobody would come on the show. And then all of a sudden the, the worm turned and all of a sudden everybody wanted on the show. And yeah. it was like a gray area in between. But Dick Clark came on way earlier than a lot of people him and uh and like arnold schwarzenegger came on before any, you know when when you could count on your fingers of one hand they the truly famous people that did the show you know it was almost like a, a badge of courage or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but it was good. interesting well you know jackie uh is friends with one of rock and wrap it up's big supporters and that's sharon osborne uh, Sharon has been with us 25 years. I just saw that Ozzy was recognized 20 years ago for the star of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Sharon asked me to write the letter to them talking about his attributes, accomplishments, his charity work. And I wrote that letter, uh, I'm sure others did as well, to help Ozzy get his star. And Sharon has still been with us. Uh, she asked me to go on her TV show uh, 10 years ago when she had a VH1 program, uh, School of Rock. And uh, her daughter, Kelly, when she was 12, did a PSA for us for our school program in 1997. Uh, mm -hmm. And Sharon and I was one of the first to join us. And they always say the nicest things about Jackie, by the way. Sharon. Well, they, they, were, they, uh, they were very close friends of the Stern Show, you know, and, uh, and they, they were friends, you know, a, a strange couple, strange people, but totally real sweet. You know, you know, you know how this business is. You 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 meet the strangest, craziest people, and some of them are total morons that you would throw off a cliff, and the other ones are the sweetest, sweetest people. But how crazy or nutty or twisted they are has nothing to do with how nice they are, which is so funny. You know, it it, it always turns out that the really famous and really the people that really, really do well wind up being a lot nicer than the middle of the road people that are still looking over their shoulders, waiting for somebody to say, you don't belong here, you know? <laughs> so, well, at least in, in my, from what I've ascertained and what do I know? You know, I got, the, you know, I got within the reaching distance of, you know, Howard, which was within reaching distance of, you know, he wasn't who he is now yet, you know? But uh, it's all it's all so damn interesting, you know. I think it's interesting. Well, it's an, an interesting business. I mean, broadcast. It's uh, and I, I I would be petrified to do what you do as a stand-up comic, 
because you, you, you have to have that energy and, and, the, and the innate uh, uh, confidence in yourself to stand up in front of a crowd and then the first few jokes you have, nobody laughs. It's, you know, it's so funny. You know, it's, I haven't done a show in so long. Like all the comics are freaking out. You know, I do a thing. Uh, I, this is not a well-disguised plug. I, I'm on cameo.com. And if you go on cameo.com slash Jackie Martling, you can get me to say happy birthday, Sid. Hey, Charlie, congratulations on your divorce. Hey, Mrs. Smith, all your children say hello. And they say, well, my mother likes poop jokes or she likes uh, the oral sex jokes. Or what. And I, I do make made to order iPhone videos through this site. A lot of a lot of talented people are doing it. And it's almost like my methadone because I get to tell jokes for two or three or four minutes and laugh and have some fun. Because if you're a comic and you don't get to go on stage and do your thing, you get a look, you get antsy. And I mean, it's been a year. There's no clubs, there's nothing open, you know, and, and those, the Zoom, as far as entertainment, I thought the Zoom things are a waste of time. You know, like they're fine for radio interviews or, or podcasts like this. It's like they're ideal. You know, I mean, this is terrific. But um, it, it's, it's weird when you don't get to do that stuff. And I'm, I, I keep thinking about what am I going to do the first time I step on stage, you know, it's going to be so much fun for me. I just, I just hope they enjoy it as much as I'm going to, because it's going to be like, it's going to be like somebody having a hot dog after they haven't eaten in 30 years, you know? Yeah. So, but it is, it can, it can be harrowing. You know, I tell people, if you're on stage and the people are laughing, there is nothing better in the world. And if you're on stage and nobody's laughing, there ain't anything worse in the world. Yeah. You know, it's like crazy. You know, it's funny. Generals, you know, you, you always see interviews with generals. They say, yeah, I'll march in the battle with a sword. But I, I'd be petrified to stand on stage in front of 50 people and, and, and do a speech, which just to me is like absurd, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm paraphrasing some people. They say like acting is easy. Comedy is hard. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. But, uh, you know, who, who knows? Who knows? You know, I, you always feel like you're getting away with it. You always feel like you're getting away with it. You know, like, I, I, you know, you, you don't say much out loud for years and years and years because you're scared it's you. And then all of a sudden you start talking to them, even the most famous comics, and they say, yeah, they walk off stage and to themselves, they're saying, well, I fooled them again. You know what I mean? Because the, the insecurity is so rampant. And then they, they walk, you walk on stage and you're king of the hill, like Red Skelton. There was nobody in show business that looked more relaxed on stage than Red Skelton. And he used to throw up and they had to push him out on stage to really? get him out there. And then he was like, he looked like he, he was more at home than he would have been in his own living room. And meanwhile, he's in the wings throwing up, you know. Yeah. I, I, I always I, think those things are so interesting, those little sidebars, you know. Yeah, I, I, I love the comedians who tell about their lives. I mean, one of my favorites going back is like a Buddy Hackett. I mean, his stories are hilarious. And it's about what he did and what he, he was involved with. They're, they're no joke, so to speak. Yeah, but, you know, truth be told, I mean, it was total. It, it was all made up. But, but it, it, it's, how, it's how it comes across. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it, it's so funny that like, everything sounds, and there's so many comics that sound like that. David Brenner used to sound like he was talking off the top of his head. And, you know, and if you went to see him the next night, it was word for word the same. Yeah. Just like people think I'm telling jokes and just pulling them out of the air at random because I know so many yeah. jokes. But I, but you have an act. You know, it's an act. You, you, you do, you, you, it's your job to make it look spontaneous, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I knew David. I, I, want, I wanted to do years ago uh, something, a show with him. His wife, want, they live in Sherman Oaks. I used to work with David when he was working as a producer at WNEW TV. When he was doing commercials before no, no, he became he, he a comic? Was, no, he was a producer at WNEW TV. I forget what show he was on with uh, at the time when, when uh, Soupy Sales was there. Right, but before he became a comic. Before he became a comic. Yeah. And I wanted yeah. to do a show of like uh, the Truman Show. I wanted to place cameras in his house, in all the rooms, except, and just do on a 24 7 basis 
and, and this and, is this a million years ago. You're talking yeah. about 1970. Yeah, this, uh, this was probably the 80s, the mid 80s. Uh, he just gotten, I think he just got married. His wife wanted to get into the business and they bought a house in Sherman Oaks. And, uh, but then it never worked out because uh, a lack in a last seat, he passed away or too early. Yeah, he was a, a nice guy. And I actually got to know him a little bit. Uh, like he actually brought me and my wife out. He had a, <laughs> the funniest thing in the world, he had a charity in, uh, what, in Aspen. There was a charity in Aspen. It was David Brenner's uh, uh, Celebrity Pro Ski Tournament. And, and I came out and I skied and almost killed myself or went into a fence. But the purpose of the charity, and I'm not making this up, the, the purpose of the charity was to raise money so the children of Aspen could have better skis. I was like, <laughs> you know, the, the world is starving and the rich kids of Aspen need better skis. I, you know, of course, anyway, they flew us out first class. They treated us like kings, you know, and I was on the show with John Oates and, you know, it could have been better. But I mean, I was like, David, couldn't you come up with something a little, you know, it's like, you know, let's, let's have, you know, let's have a charity to get better hats for mini pearl you know jesus christmas you know that's that seems logical to me sure hey but what, what they, do i know i'm from brooklyn yeah they they call i go that's that simple well no, talking but, about talk about brooklyn uh after jackie did his uh first uh MC for us i invited him we were doing it at a place called the sea wayne country club in Newland harbor and they always offered me uh slots to kind of golf and uh, i didn't take it too advantage too much advantage of it but i called jackie I said jackie you want to do a round of golf no pressure we could just hang out he said i'd love that so we wound up and we got to know each other a little bit and my background as you know is a little varied uh, i do dna genetics and cancer research for many many years and jackie told me a story i was doing uh, at that time a lot of work at harvard where we were introducing forensic uh, DNA testing. And Jackie told me a story that uh, his family uh, had this, uh, this story that everyone in the family, and I'm talking about skions on all sides of the family, uh, that they were related uh, to the father of Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Illegit Roosevelt. Illegitimately. Ill illegit oh. Illegitimate child born in up in uh, Vermont or New Hampshire. In uh, Maine. In, 19, in 1858, the same year that Teddy Roosevelt was born, the father went up there, uh, had a relationship, a child came out of it, and 20 years, that son showed up in Oyster Bay and was taken in like a child. And that is Jackie's family. Ah. Now, he, my my great-great-grandfather, not my great grandfather great, great. Franklin Hall, uh, no, my great grandfather Franklin Hall, um, worked at Sagmore Hill and then went to the White House with Theodore Roosevelt. And the rumor was that he's the Ill illegitimate son of Teddy's father, who was off hunting while Teddy was being born in 1858. Well. And it's a, but the point of the thing is. Everybody in town, and it's a it's a rumor that's supposed to be totally. If you look up, everything lines up, but we have no real proof. But if I could get a Roosevelt to give us a DNA sample, we would know. It's it's white or black. It's yes or no. But I cannot. Well, let's I work cannot. on. Let's this work on. Jackie, it. This is Jackie's uh, DNA. Uh -huh. um, we took a cheek swab of Jackie, and all these years I've kept it. We're still waiting. For trying to get, try, some, I've come so close to someone get someone who is on one this one end of the family. Roosevelt, if you do that, one and, anyway, one. anyway, guys, on that note, our time has run out, believe it or not. Oh, that was too fast. That's about it. Well, well, Jackie, if you have time, we'll uh, do another show with you. I have no problem. I'm ready anytime, anytime, <laughs> any, and then my eye will be cured so I can, I'll actually be able to see you guys. Okay. But well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And, and Sid?
We'll get to get. I, did you want to do another show tomorrow or? Uh, you know what? Uh, we'll no. skip it. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do it next Tuesday. Okay. We, we have a, a couple of things we're working on, actually. Uh, Jackie's going to be coming out on Thursday uh, because of Jackie's work with veterans. He's uh, going to be doing a comedy little bit for our senior veterans that come to our farmer's market. Ah. And it's going to be great. And uh, I uh, last week, uh, one of the local TV stations, Channel 12, which I think is Cablevision, uh, did a, a piece on Rock and Wrap It Up. And the American Legion did a piece. It was picked up by CBS television. And they want to come out and do a little piece on the veteran farmers market so uh, we could expand and get even more American Legion VFW posts to help feed senior citizens that are at risk across America. Great. Uh, anyway, to wrap, to, wrap, yeah, to wrap it up, uh, wh where can people reach you, Jackie, or, or see your work? I, I answer all email, jokeland, J-O-K-E-L-A-N-D at AOL.com. I always give out my email address and I get emails from all over the world. I heard you on this show, I heard you on that show because I met so many people along the way. So if you email me, I will answer. And if you want a personalized video, go to cameo.com slash Jackie Martin.